starting our Google Hangout now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Google Hangout on air with two amazing people, James Dashner, author of the New York Times bestselling series, The Maze Runner and Mortality Doctrine, and Krista Marino, his awesome editor. My name is Aisha Cloud, publicity manager at Random House Kids. Before we get started, I want to be sure you all were aware of how to submit questions and vote for your favorites. There are two ways you could be watching this Hangout right now. Most of you are probably on Google+. You'll know that you're on Google+, you're seeing what's called the Showcase Panel on the right-hand side of your window. Right hand. Right hand. If you're watching on YouTube, you do not see that panel. But instead, there's a message in the bottom left-hand corner of your video. Left hand. When you click that, if you send you to watch Google+, which I would suggest doing so you can submit and vote on questions. When you get to Google+, Plus, and for those already there, if you'd like to submit a question or vote for your favorite, we will just need to toggle from that showcase panel on your right-hand side to what's called the Q&A panel, somewhere around here, by clicking on the little keypad icon in the upper right-hand corner of this window. It looks just like the keypad on a phone, a square with nine little dots. Find that keypad, click on it. You should see both the showcase and Q&A icons. Click on the Q&A Q&A icon to show the Q&A panel. You'll see how easy it is to submit your own question or upvote someone else's by clicking plus one. Question with the most plus one will flow to the top. Once again, thank you for joining us today. And now I'm going to turn things over to James and Krista to answer your amazing and awesome questions about the TED career. So you guys, take it Excellent. away. Excellent. I'm disappearing as usual. And obviously, if you need anything, let me know. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Hi, Krista. Um, I'm really excited to talk about the death cure. Me too. <laughs> um, okay. For a second, for a second, I was for a second I was hearing some weird echoes, but maybe okay. it's okay now. Uh, well, this is an awesome moment, too, like timed exactly with the announcement that the movie is going um, yeah. in production in February, so, so no one has to ask us. Yes, the movie, um, Dylan's doing well, the movie's back on track, they're going to start filming again in February. Woo! Yes, I was uh, very thrilled to see them actually announce that. Yeah. A big deal, that means... Uh, you know, even though we've known this for a while, it seems like it's really official now. So uh, we can take a breath, relax, get excited all over again. It's going to be a fun year and a half leading up to the movie. Yeah, and in the meantime, you can go and see Dylan and Darkwater Horizon. I know. Deepwater Horizon. Sorry, whatever. Same thing. Yeah. Deep in its dark. And Mark Wahlberg. So it'll be awesome. And Kate Hudson. It looks good. Oh, Kate Hudson. Um, okay, so should we begin this talk with and get the um, the elephant out of the room and talk about Newt? <laughs> we'll do. I'll, you're the boss, as usual. I'll do whatever you say. Um. Okay. I guess we don't worry about spoilers, right? No, no, no. This is like a. a yeah, if you haven't read the Death Cure, you shouldn't be watching. Or you can listen and just be open to spoilers and it'll make you want to read it more. Right. This is kind of like an after the show on Bravo. Yeah. Like the Talking Dead? Yeah, yeah. We should do a podcast. We should, totally. Um, okay, so the first, there is a question here that, that's got a lot of votes up and it is about Newt. And so Newt has a sad time in this book and I think that it was between you and I when you talked about who is going to pass away. We had like lots of conversations about this, and should we talk about that before we answer questions? Like who the who got his, who got um, yeah his, so his execution yeah and, and you know the whole thing with Newt is very interesting because I never really guessed that he would become everyone's favorite. But, I mean, it's by a pretty large margin that he's 
people's favorite when I, you know, when you say who's your favorite character. And uh, it's funny because I always get people making me sign page 250 with a frowny face, and people always say, why Newt, when they come up to me in line. And it's been, I mean, it's sad, but it's also hilarious to me that, um, that people take it out on me, and it's just been kind of a fun thing. But yeah, I, I distinctly remember, you know, for years I had had this major death planned where I wanted someone to not be immune to the flare. And we had basically narrowed it down to either Newt or Min Ho. And I remember you very adamantly wanted Min Ho to live, so people who love Min Ho can thank you for that. But I remember saying, Min Ho can't die. No, 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 he can't die. And then I wanted Teresa to get killed. Yeah. Yeah, you were mostly responsible for that, too. Sorry. No one bothers you about that, though. Mm, sometimes. Just really? yesterday, someone was bugging me how sad they were about Teresa. But I do think we both agreed that she was really messed up in the head and had been severely damaged. For some reason, she just... All these things had taken a too heavy a toll on her, so she had her little moment of redemption, and it felt right the way she met her demise. Yeah. Okay, so... I'm trying, to, I'm trying not to smile when we talk about these people dying. I know. I am I love Newt, but you're right. I didn't realize either. Like, in my heart, I always was in love with Minho. Minho was, to me, in my mind, as I read these books, Thomas's kind of best friend. And it's become also, in retrospect, very clear how close he was to Newt. Yes. Well. But in my like, I always envisioned them together, kind of in a partnership of running and I don't know, like been through it, kind of together. They they really depended on each other in the maze a lot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, it's just a, it's such a dark world, such a harsh story that people were going to die. If everyone had just made it to the end, safe and sound, I just think it would have been unrealistic and unsatisfying. And sometimes, you know, you remember a character more if they've died. And uh, I kind of feel like people remember Newt more because he had a tragic end and was a good, good had a good heart. Yeah, totally. If he had lived, you know, I don't think people would talk about him nearly as much. You know, it's that whole martyr thing. So I'm very sorry for the people who, you know, jokingly get mad at me. I think some people really do get mad at me. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm going to ask you a question that yeah. is all in um, preparation. All this chatter was in preparation for this question. Okay, so we got Newt's death out of the way. The question is um, from Kiaz the Rogue. It says, I am pretty sure we're all upset that Newt died, but what do you think would have happened to him if he was immune? Would he have affected the story in any way, or would it have not been that much different at all? Well, I think that would have made a huge difference, you know, in the whole storyline, because part of the reason I love Death Cure is just that uh, Thomas and the others, you know, even knowing that Newt, basically has little chance to survive. They they throw all their efforts into doing whatever they can to save him. They go to the Crank Palace and then uh, you know later when Thomas sees him on the side of the road he makes uh, Lawrence pull over the van. So that's just really touching to me, that loyalty and friendship um, that's so evident in those scenes. So if Newt had been immune a lot of that stuff wouldn't have happened. You know, we would have had to put a lot of thought into all the ripple effects of that, mm -hmm. you know, where the story would have gone. But, you know, it's fun to think about. Also, it was them really kind of, they lost Chuck, but he, Thomas hadn't really known Chuck for that long before he lost him, and then losing Newt was really kind of made him face like, again, how awful this world had been. So it was yeah. like another 
sometimes it hits me that okay, over three books we had, you know, Chuck, Ben, Albie, Winston, Newt, Teresa. Uh, I mean, that is a lot of people, and sometimes I wonder, man, did I did I have too many people die? But I just think it's true to that world. It's it's very realistic to what a harsh environment they were. And basically they all could have died. And the fact that uh, some of them survived to the end and have a little bit of hope, I think it's uh, pretty realistic and fair to the world that we built. So that leads me to another question, which is... It, these things pop up and down. Um, do you ever feel bad for killing your characters? You killed a lot uh, of people. Well, I mean, I kind of just answered that. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I doubt myself. You know. Um, also, okay. The other half of this question is: Do you just how do you decide which characters to kill? I feel like it's kind of organic, huh? Like every now and then, you would come to me and be like. Okay, I have two ideas, and then I would react very violently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, we, I think we have a fight, a good balance between, you know, we definitely outline and plan ahead, but also if we have new ideas or take, you know, su you know, surprise turns or whatever, we never hesitate to do those, which I think is really important to not get too static and, you know sticking to one path and uh, but it's a good example basically I knew for a long time I wanted one of the major characters to die from the flare uh, in some way and we narrowed it down to Newt and Minho and then Newt and then uh, Teresa yeah I mean I was not planning that I'm pretty sure that in the first draft she didn't die and that's when we started talking about maybe having her moment of redemption and dying. I can't remember what stage that change happened but uh, you know it's not like flipping a coin or anything we don't just do it and giggles and you know people like to call me Lord Satan and all that stuff but um, it's I all good. I feel like writing this last book though James hasn't it been I mean there are pieces of Teresa, not to spoil the kill order, in the kill order, and I feel like this last book really makes her the meaning, when I say last book, the fever code, the new book, like it's, she is such an important part of the story, in a, but I'm not sure that we ever really realized how big of a part of a story she was. You know, yeah. like... It's like she she becomes really important. Yeah, she's really developed and evolved. I think Teresa, more than anyone else, is really symbolic of what the point of the whole series was. That you know, no one is just this or that, good or evil, black or white. And she is just, especially with the fever code, I think... You know, I didn't know if we could add another layer to her character, but I think we definitely did. Definitely. I think throughout the whole series, she'll be remembered as the most fascinating, complex character, and it, it'll be cool to see what people think of uh, the Fever Code and her storyline. Yeah. Okay, so next story, to get on to a more um, upbeat, next, not next story, next question, a more upbeat uh, tone. You mentioned Minho flirting with a girl from Group B a couple of times. Did he ever get the girl? And that's from Adriana O'Keefe. Sure, yes. I like Minho's got game. Yeah, I mean, uh, he definitely, you know, I, I really feel like even though it's a sad series in a lot of ways, the people who did make it to the end... I totally feel like in the long run they're going to live out the rest of their lives and find happiness with whoever they can find happiness with and start a new civilization, start life over again, and conquer the world again. And yeah, I think uh, I think Minho will 
you know, he'll probably enjoy life for a few years, but, but uh, I could see him, you know, getting the girl of his dreams and settling down and having little Minho babies like Thomas joked about earlier. <laughs> okay, so what's your inspiration for the flair from Kyla, Kayla Novak? Well, I've always been extremely terrified of viruses. You know, we've had a few scares in our lifetime. Of You start hearing about this bird flu or avian flu or whatever. Now you have the Zika virus. And it's like all those terrible, awful, horrible movies like Breakout where these diseases take over the world. So it's just something that's always fascinated me and scared me. And I wanted to use it somehow, but I wanted it to be different. You know, I didn't want it to just be a, a typical flu or something that killed people. I also didn't want it to go full-on zombie and just be that unrealistic. So I loved meeting in the middle somewhere, this virus that uh, takes over people. And instead of focusing on the illness and the mortality rate, I just love the concept. I don't know where it came from. I guess the, the thought of an insane person scares me too. And just this illness that attacks the brain, drives you completely crazy, so that you have no more rationale, no more conscience, and you just completely act out of animalistic you know, survival mode. That was the gelling of it, and... You know, so it was inspired by a lot of different things, but that's where we came at. Um, okay. Next question. There's All some, right. There's a lot of really good questions. Okay, so um, do you think Thomas would have forgiven Teresa if he had had his memories restored? Would he understand that Teresa didn't have a choice? Yes. And I, I think... Uh, Whoever wrote, whoever asked that question, they that was oh that was Gunner Scale seventy seven. Ooh, an Eye of Minds. Your reference. Sweet, I like this person. They've read the Eye of Minds. Sorry, seven 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 Gunner Scale seven seven seven. Cool. Okay. By the way, all you Maze Runner fans, you need to read Eye of Minds. I promise you'll like it. Anyway, yeah. um, that so Gunner Scale whatever, you're going to love the fever code because, you know, in the books, you know, we went back and forth but decided that Thomas would not get his memories back. But the fever code is, is, is kind of a delayed reaction to him having his memories because you see it firsthand what happened to him. And so uh, a lot of the things he would have remembered you see firsthand in the fever code. And... I really don't even want to get close to, to possibly spoiling some of the surprises we developed from the end of that book. But I'll just go back to what I said earlier. Teresa's story gets even more interesting. And even though it's a prequel and you think you know exactly how it ends, there's some surprises. But in the no matter what happens or what you haven't even read yet, I do think... Thomas would have forgiven Teresa, but I don't know if they could have ever been quite the same or if they ever could have been quite the good friends that they were that you'll see in parts of Fever Code. Okay, here's a great um, Fever Code question. Um, okay, I really want to know if in the Fever Code we'll see Newt and Thomas's relationship, how they start to be friends before they had their memories deleted. From Sarah Amelia. Yeah, you you'll definitely see all the characters that you grew love in the Maze Runner trilogy. You'll see some how they met and how some of those relationships formed, some of the very strange things they went through. There's a couple of really cool scenes with with Thomas and Newt that uh, that I really like, where they just they see some things within the, the Wicked headquarters that are pretty cool. And, uh, you know, even though their memories are wiped later, I think you see the foundation of their friendships and why 
they felt so naturally bonded. You know, all the characters when they finally do end up together in the glade in the Maze Runner. Um, so you see the synthesis of that in the Fever Code. I'm just really excited for everyone to read the Fever Code because we've been holding all of these kind of secrets in our head for several, like a year, and it's been hard not to talk about it, and I feel like people are going to be so surprised and satisfied. I sure hope so. We because worked hard on that book. So surprising. Everything's really surprising, but also... Familiar. The information people want, but it's very surprising answers to questions, I think. Yeah, it's... I think it'll... I really don't think it's going to be what people expect, but I think it'll be what they want. Exactly. Well put. Well put, yes, indeed. I worked um, hard on that for hours. Here's a good question, which I don't even know the answer to. Um, who is the first character you created in the Maze Runner? And that's from Castalia. That's definitely Thomas. You know, when I the very first night that I started thinking about this story, and you know, it was just one night I was going to bed, and this happens to me all the time, where my brain just goes nuts thinking of ideas. And the maze runners. Recorder, by the way, how do you like record all of your ideas? Stuff like that, when it's just impromptu brainstorming, I like to write hand write them in a notebook. Okay. Uh, sometimes, if I don't have that, I'll I'll email myself, type a bunch of ideas, and email it so I don't forget it later. But, but yeah, I you know I was watching the TV show Lost at this time which I think really influenced just the first ideas of Maze Runner. But that one night, I just sat down, I was jotting all these ideas, and I was definitely thinking of the main character at first. I knew that we would tell the story from his perspective. You know, I decided that very early on, that we would just stick with one perspective, uh, be in Thomas's head, and uh, I named him Thomas... After my grandpa, Thomas Edgar Player. So he was definitely the first guy. And because we're in his head, he's the one who I most identify with. You know, he's basically my thoughts, my reactions. I mean, he's way braver, but he definitely thinks and talks and acts, you know, not completely, but more than anyone else like me. Um, okay, so I've got a question here about the new book, and it is from Alexa, and the question is, which I feel like, I don't know, I don't want you to do any spoilers, but the question is, who has the most shocking backstory in the Fever Code? Oh, very good question, Alexa. I feel like I have my answer, and I feel like every reader might have a different answer. Well, just for fun, let's hear your answer first. I would say my answer is maybe Ava Page. Oh. Yeah, don't say anything else. I won't. Uh, I do think it's kind of fun, though, that Ava Page suddenly becomes such an in-scene major character in the Fever Code. I think that'll. I think people will have a lot of fun with that. She's, she was so mysterious. She was so, like, um, rare, rarely seen. Yeah. And she's more, she's more visible in the movies, but in the books, she was definitely kept to the background. And, of course, this is book world, not movie world. Although I, I'm sure people will envision Patricia Clarkson as they read that book. I know I did as I wrote it. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a that's a really good answer because, I mean, by far as a proportionally or whatever, we learn way more about Ava Page than anyone else, just because we knew nothing before. No, exactly, yeah. But and, you know, kind of shocking. I would say Teresa 
Well, backstory. Um, I mean, a lot of people have already read this, the prologue, but we learned about how Newt got captured. I think it's interesting about Thomas's name, but uh, I would say Teresa's will end up being the most shocking storyline. Um. Okay, so I haven't seen any questions about this yet, so I'm going to ask my own question. What about Galley's return? Oh. I mean, come on. He was, oh, yeah, I forgot. We're actually, this is really That was really so surprising. Cool. We lost someone and we gained someone, right? Yes, yes. And I'm thrilled that they're sticking with that for the movie to have, are you talking about Fever Code or Death Cure? I'm talking about Death Cure. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, good to, so, yeah. Good so to get us back on topic with Death Cure. Yeah, it's... I, you know, the movie... I, I was know. surprised when you brought him back. Like, you're always so full. You are this idea, like, your mind is in, like, works in mysterious ways, and you are the best surpriser of all times. Do, do you play pranks on your family? <laughs> Not really, actually. I guess I said it all for the book. Keep it to your books. I'm actually one of those people who hates pranks. <laughs> when I was in college, I absolutely despised when people would play pranks on you. Like, like April Fool's Day? Yeah, the worst one I ever saw were these bunch of ladies broke into these guys' apartment and put all these fall leaves into their beds and their bathtub and their kitchen just all over their apartment, and it took them like six weeks to clean it. That is the most creative and worst thing I've ever heard, and it, I'm filing it away. Oh, it's so awful. That's the worst thing. Um, so I'm not a big fan of pranks. I know that was a little off topic, but anyway. But you are the best, like, surpriser, like, twist, twist writer. And when I was reading the Death Care manuscript and Gallus showed up again, I was like, what? Yeah, that was fun because, you know, in uh, in the books, it was much more ambiguous what happened to Galley. And I remember after, especially after just the first Mage Runner book came out, people would constantly ask me, so what happened to all the people that got left in the maze? And my answer was always, well, actually, they became irrelevant because they because they stayed behind they were no longer part of the experiment and that just opened it up you know I didn't wicked wasn't the type of people they were just gonna go in there and slaughter all these kids that was never what they were about and people assumed well they, they stayed behind the glade so the grievers probably came in and killed them all but I absolutely believe that's not true instead wicked was like, okay, these guys are now irrelevant. They're not part of the experiment anymore. Experiment anymore. So basically, they just took them out, and you know, they might have continued testing them or whatever, but they didn't just go in and slaughter them. So in my mind, I always knew that Galley was still alive, and I loved, I loved that switch of his role where he went out escaped, joined this rebel group, and ends up being an ally, such a huge ally to Thomas. And, uh, you know, Galley's another one of those that survived. So, Well, she, and like you don't know if, who is your real ally and who is your enemy. Right. And what is their motivation. That's like the gray area you so geniusly mine in these books. Well, thank you, Krista. Mm-hmm. I just thought of another piece of the book, and then I forgot it as you were answering because I was really interested in your answer. Um, okay, let me ask you this question. Okay. Did you ever consider killing Thomas? Not very seriously. I mean, I I am very, very, I, you know, I, I very strongly believe that... I should never close my mind off to any idea because some of my most ridiculous, outrageous ideas have become 
things that people have loved the most. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I should admit this publicly, but at one point I was even considering, not really seriously, but just in my wild thoughts, I thought, what if, what if they really did? We find out at the end of Death Cure they really had taken Thomas's brain out of his body, and were studying it and and stimulating it like with like dreams. What? Like the man with two brains? Yeah. <laughs> I thought. I mean, it would have been the dumbest ending of all time that you see Thomas's brain in a jar or something. But my point is, that idea did come into my brain and, you know, pretty quickly got stomped. But it just shows that, you know, I'll entertain any idea and see how it feels. So, yeah, we definitely, you know, considered Thomas dying. It would have been very uh, realistic for him to die. But in the end just wasn't the right thing to do. We were in his head. You know, we could have done a Sopranos thing where when he died, the book just ends. That actually would have been kind of cool. And then you never know what happened to the others. Oh, we should have done that. No! He would never... No. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, yeah, we entertained the idea, but never too seriously. Um, okay, so here's a question I've seen a couple times on, on the question board is, about paradise, which is at the end of the death cure, and is it on Earth? Yes, definitely. 100% definitely on Earth. Okay. Here's another question. I just want to open it up. Is one thing, okay, so this book to me was, all of your books have been impressive to work on, but to me this book, like you did so many things that I was like wowed by, like, bringing Galley back and then killing Newt, or, or killing someone, and then Newt. Um, and the satisfaction of Teresa getting rolled over by a giant boulder. I think that's how she ended up dying. I remember at one point she did get squashed by a boulder. Wait, who? Teresa. Oh, well, she was in the... Crashed. She was, yeah, crushed in that warehouse that was collapsing. Which brings me back to going back to the maze and discovering where the maze actually is. In, yeah. And yeah. that was so, I was like, of course. I would never have even thought this. You end where you begin. Yeah, that was very important to me. I remember when I was writing that, I was scared that you and Michael, my agent Michael, would uh, not like that idea, but I loved that we that I figured out a way for them to come full circle, and it made sense. You know, it was a lot of technology and uh, optical illusions and sensors in their brains and stuff that that made that possible for it to actually be an underground um, structure, and it would make sense they have this big structure to use it later for storage or to have people live in it, you know, refugees, uh, these munis that they had collected, whatever. And I just absolutely loved the image of Thomas returning to that maze, seeing it with all those optical illusion things turned off, all that technology, and uh, watching part of it crumble and destroy. That was, that was a lot of fun for me to write, to have them back inside the maze. Um, and how it was so outside in the first book. It was so totally outside in this beautiful outside location, and it's not outside. Yeah, which, you know, you get a, a – you obviously know that from the yeah. whole fake sun thing. From the end of the first book, but seeing the, all of the stuff turned off. Yeah, it's, it's totally different when it's completely shut down. And uh, that'll be a fun thing for people in the Fever Code to see a little bit about. I mean, you'll how the main built. Yeah, you'll learn more about that structure, which is super interesting. And um, okay, so here's an interesting question, and I think it's good for talking about like how you came up with your like your original idea. You were watching Lost, you said, and then. Um, you get your crazy ideas when you're going to bed and you write them down and you send them to yourself. So 
So someone's asking, what pointer do you have for a friend, or not for a friend, for a fan, who is a friend, because your fans are your friends. That's right. Um, who are writers? Like, what kind of, like, what would be three tips you would give, give on fans writing people who, your fans, who have um, writing dreams? Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, that's, you know, one of my most frequent questions is, you know, how do I become a writer? You know, how do you get your ideas? You know, give me some tips, whatever. And I feel like I really suck at giving golden nuggets of information that will help you be a better writer. But uh, I've definitely learned that the number one most important by a long shot thing that I do to keep my creativity strong and to make sure I'm always getting ideas is I consume storytelling as much as possible. And, uh, you know, just because you enjoy something tremendously does not mean that it's not important and that it's work and that it's a job. And, uh, you know, my family makes fun of me saying I watch movies all the time. I just sit around, you know, doing nothing, but it's not true. I watch tons of movies. I watch tons of uh, TV shows. I read tons of books. But it's exactly how I keep my mind fresh with creativity. And every time I watch a movie, and I'm, you know, every page I read in a book, it triggers some something, either an idea or an image. Or a way to solve a problem, I feel like, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it, usually it's totally unrelated to what I'm reading. For some reason, it, it's just triggered by it. Or a character flaw or a character strength or a, just even a cool word that I kind of forgot existed that I want to use somehow. Um, just all kinds of stuff. So I would, I would consume a lot of pop culture and storytelling you know, movies, TV, theater, books. I always jot down things. If you think of something cool, you know, a lot of times you'll you'll think, oh, I'll remember this because it's so cool, but you forget. So, and usually when you jot something down, that triggers other things, and you end up writing a whole page of notes. Um, it's kind of cliche in elementary school, but brainstorming is extremely valuable to just open up your mind and write down whatever pops in your head no matter how stupid it is and usually a few gems will come out of that. I would say also and you wrote so much for so long out of just like your love of writing um, to never stop writing. Right? Yeah, like For sure. It's not your first story. You like sometimes your first story isn't your most um, successful publication. Exactly. You know, I'm, you I'm always inspired by uh, my good friend Brandon Sanderson. You know, he had written, so his first book that got published was the sixth book that he had written. That's crazy. And he was writing his 11th book when the sixth book finally got published as his first published novel. So And his novels are like eleven 1, hundred pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's insane. I don't know how he does it. But um so yeah, if you love writing, then you know you're not doing it just to get published. Obviously you want to, but make sure you love it enough to write a few books even if they don't get published. Yeah. Because, yeah, definitely your first one isn't necessarily the first one that will get published, I would say. Um, okay. So here's some a little bit of levity. Here's a question. What, what were you thinking? And this is part of you that I love dearly is how your brain works. And what happened, what was going on in your head when you came up with the term runny undies? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just... You know, we used to always say tidy whities Yeah. And uh, for some reason, I mean, I'm 
in my extremely juvenile brain, that still cracks me up if I ever hear the term tidy whities And so I was just trying to think of something that was similar. And they're undies, and they run in them. And I just thought runny undies sound funny. And uh, it's one of those things that just popped out of my brain as I was literally typing. They're probably really high tech too, because they're from the future. <laughs> they're made to run. I kind of yeah. want jeans to make some runny undies. We should. This is a genius marketing idea. I can't yeah. believe it. You like. Uh, Fox hasn't made Maze Runner runny undies yet. This is ridiculous. I'm making a note. Maze Runner runny undies. Yes, this has to happen. I bet we get. I bet we have a hundred pre-orders uh, committed already. Okay. And if you would like a pair of Maze Runner runny undies, tweet me that you would like a pair. We'll see what happens. We'll see if we can get. And I think on the butt cheeks, it should say. Yes. Runner. <laughs> Something has to be on the butt cheeks, no doubt. Um, okay, okay. Back to, back to, back to life, back to reality. Remember that song? Sorry. Yes. I that, I think that was my song. Okay. Um, let's see. What should we, okay, should we, uh, okay, so here's a sweet question. Are you your children's favorite author? All right, this is the honest answer. I really do think that I am my kid's favorite author. That's awesome. Because each one of them, when they turned about 12, well, three of them have turned 12. I have one more. All of them read the Maze Runner series when they turned 12 or so. And, you know, they, they were not just trying to, like, they're not the type of kids who would just, you know, try to be nice to me or something. They devoured them and read them really quickly, quicker than they read other books. And I think it was just that. Added they, they had to. They were all, he's paying for our food. you got to pay this. <laughs> and there was that, that added intrigue that this is so weird. My dad wrote this stuff. But my oldest son, he's not a big reader. But he is, he's definitely read all of my books. And um, so maybe I'm just, you know, delusional, but I think that I'm their favorite author. I'm definitely their favorite dad. That's awesome. That's, that's what matters. That's good. I'm their, I'm their only dad, but I am their favorite. But they could have another favorite dad. <laughs> I love that they're, yes, of course you are. Okay, so. Okay, so here's a good question. Why did Ava Page help them to escape in the end? And who knows about paradise? And that's from Emily. Yeah, Emily, that's that's a great question because even though Ava Page is so much in the background in the books, I still feel like we get a real sense of her story arc, her character arc. She, and you'll see this a little bit in the Fever Code, um, she desperately wanted to find a cure for the flare. And she was willing to get ruthless. She was willing to sacrifice the few to save the many, ends justifying the means, all that kind of stuff. But she's also very pragmatic. And when she got to the point that she didn't think they could do it anymore, she changed her mindset and realized, you know what, we got to save these people who are immune because this might be our last chance. You know, I think this flare cure has failed. And that was, you know, that was a decision we had to make. You know, could this series end with a really happy lolly da ending where, yay, we found a cure and we're going to go around injecting all these cranks and everybody's, it just didn't feel right. I felt like what they did to try to find the cure was justified and realistic. But it seemed like too much of a, a neatly wrapped package to just end it with a cure. But we met kind of halfway where there's still some hope at the end, but kind of a bleak, realistic ending to, to a story. Okay, so I just got notice that we have time for one more question, and then you're going to announce the winner 
of... Yes, signed copies of the Maze Runner. Yes. And does that include the new book? Sure, why not? My little, yes, my, I'm on my little pop-up pop -up answer. Oh. Well, we can, yes. the magical people at Random House said no, but I am overruling them. Yeah, we're we're both overruling. We'll I will do it there. myself. We will you send have to her. No, but you have to wait till the day it comes out, and then we'll send it. Yes. So it'll be later. Okay. So, okay. Fine. We will do it. <laughs> that was our note. Okay. I have so much power. It's it's crazy. <laughs> okay. So um. Let's see what kind of question we want to answer. James, do you have an idea, or do you want to just like pre freestyle an answer? I feel like okay. So my, are you thinking about writing a book about Group B? Is the question I want to ask you. And I know that we talk about not doing any more major on our books, and certainly not in the future foreseeable where we won't have wrinkles. But I always want you to, to answer, like, I'm always saying, what happened in the maze in group, for group B? What happened in the maze for group B? And you're, like, so closed-mouthed about it. So you make me more curious. Well, you know, I, I would absolutely never say never on any book. Um, we definitely want to take... A break. A, a very long break from Maze Runner. Um, as of right now, I certainly don't plan on writing that book. If I did write another Maze Runner book, it would have to be something like that, some kind of alternate viewpoint, and Group B would make a lot of sense because then you could just really have, you know, totally not necessarily new characters, but characters we know nothing about, and it, you could make it feel like a fresh story, but it's not in our plans anywhere near the immediate future. Um, I want to try some different things, I'm trying to write a horror novel right now, um, we have other stuff, fun stuff planned. But, uh, okay, so the winner of the signed books, and yes, I will force Random House, because they're lovely people. We will totally. To send you the even the new book when it comes out. Her name is Samantha Nuryadi. Samantha Nuryadi. So uh, Corporate Random House will be contacting you. And you're going to get some signed books, and it's going to be awesome. And uh, you have to read them all over again. You'll have to give us, um, I don't know, we want some sort of report on the new book. <laughs> yes, you need, to, you need to tell us what you think. Yeah. Of the new book. Or tweet about it. We'll have to make you tweet about it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, James. You're amazing. So, yes, winner... If you didn't hear her name, her name is Samantha Nordy. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, but thank you so much. You will get signed copies of the Maze Runner series. And thank you, James, again. We will send you a copy of The Fever Code. So thank you for joining us. I know I've been saying a lot of thank you, but thank you again. If you want to learn more about the books, especially... The Fever Code, check out james-nerd.com and tune in to our next Gold Hangout about the Kill Order. Yes, we have one more. You guys are excited. I can feel it. I can feel it. Um, as part of the Dash Nerd Dash Binge Read, it's on Thursday, September 22nd at 8 p.m. EDT time. EST time? EDT. EST. I don't, I don't understand. EST. 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 Yeah, my time. I get 8 p.m. my time. EDT is Seattle. <laughs> just, just be there because we want to see you guys. Um, until then, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.